Què tal? Què tal a tothom? Que bé. Que bé que amb un acte tan improvisat va aparèixer a partir d'una trucada que em va fer l'Enric. Li hem d'agrair la possibilitat de poder compartir i poder tenir el Thomas Daniel avui aquí. I una cosa que ens va passar pel cap és, ostres, en una setmana com aconseguirem activar-ho i realment tant des de la cooperativa Jordi Capell com com jo i tu i el Tomàs, que ha decidit que ha pogut venir, doncs hem pogut fer aquest acte. I una de les coses que pensàvem és com podrem convocar la gent. I podem veure que quan la conferència és interessant, la gent ve. Jo estava dient que preparar tot això en tan poc temps és complicat, que la gent ve. Estic molt content que sigueu tots aquí. I que us hagi agradat el vostre temps. Estic molt content que sigueu tots aquí. I vaja, jo deixaré que el protagonisme estigui en mans de l'Enric i del Tomàs. L'Enric coneix bé el Tomàs. Jo, de fet, l'he conegut a partir que l'Enric me n'ha parlat i he estat mirant la seva obra i els seus llibres i la seva trajectòria, que em semblen superinteressants. Per això estic tan content que hi hagi tanta gent avui. I, bueno, això, ho deixaré. Deixaré que facis tu la presentació d'ell, que en saps i ho faràs de manera més personal. I us passo la paraula a l'Enric Masip i al Tomàs. Tomàs, thank you for coming and I hope you have a good time here in our in our house, the Architects House in Barcelona. Gràcies. Gràcies, Guim. Gràcies a tota l'organització i a la cooperativa Jordi Capell que han fet possible en tan de poc de temps d'organitzar aquest acte. I moltes gràcies, sobretot, als que heu pogut venir avui aquí. Us agradeixo molt personalment pel vostre interès. Jo crec que aprendrem moltes coses. Per tant, també heu d'estar contents d'estar en una ocasió tan especial com la d'avui. El Thomas Daniel és en aquests moments segurament el crític occidental més ben considerat sobre l'arquitectura japonesa en l'art contemporani. És el que té una visió més àmplia, més profunda, més en detall, més en general, d'un panorama que avui ens explicarà en la seva conferència. És un panorama molt complex, d'una riquesa extraordinària, l'ecosistema arquitectònic japonès és realment extraordinari, i que no no s'explica simplement per un parell de factors, perquè hi hagi una administració pública potent que aposti per l'arquitectura o perquè hi hagi una tradició de construcció molt consolidada, etc. No. Sorgeix per altres factors que realment són molt difícils d'explicar. L'extraordinària creativitat, l'extraordinària capacitat de reinvenció, l'extraordinària resiliència dels mateixos arquitectes al Japó, jo crec que és un fet molt, molt insòlit. I això és el que avui ens explicarà el Thomas en la seva conferència. Aquest panorama que va des de la postguerra fins al post-tsunami i que ha sigut capaç de reinventar-se no només des d'una posició local i de respondre a unes certes necessitats pròpies o a unes certes dinàmiques culturals pròpies, sinó que ha sigut capaç de projectar-se com a model internacional, com a model global. Pensem, per una altra banda, que l'arquitectura japonesa que coneixem, que avui en dia està feta per desenes de despatxos d'una qualitat excepcional, és una arquitectura realment molt poc rellevant a la ciutat. La ciutat japonesa no es construeix pels arquitectes, no la fan els arquitectes. La ciutat japonesa es fa per uns processos d'un dinamisme econòmic, corporatiu i administratiu molt bèsties, en els quals els arquitectes tenen poquíssima participació. Per tant, el fet que l'arquitectura japonesa que coneixem, que és la que valorem, etc., és una arquitectura de resistència. I per mi, aquest és un dels valors més importants. Perquè el que està passant al Japó ens està començant a passar a nosaltres. Nosaltres hem de començar a fer arquitectura de resistència contra unes forces molt violentes, 
per les que l'arquitectura tal com ens interessa a nosaltres entendre-la no té cap valor. El Thomas té una virtut, entre moltes altres, i és que ell ara és un full professor, és un professor que es dedica a l'ensenyament a la Universitat de Kyoto, però la seva els seus inicis professionals va ser com a arquitecte que practicava l'arquitectura. Primer va anar a treballar amb Shin Takamatsu a Kyoto, al Japó, un cop acabada la carrera, a Nova Zelanda. Després va treballar a OMA en projectes japonesos i després es va decidir quedar al Japó, va fer alguns projectes al Japó i finalment s'ha anat consolidant com una veu amb aquesta doble passant de coneixement internacional i coneixement local capaç d'entendre aquesta complexitat de la que es parlava al principi. El Thomas, a més a més, escriu molt bé. Jo aquí us porto un llibre que a Amazon deu valer 500 euros perquè està esgotat que no el tenim aquí a la cooperativa, però que en canvi teniu l'últim llibre que ha publicat, que és un llibre magnífic, maquíssim, una edició exquisida d'AIA. I aquest primer llibre que us porto aquí, que es diu After the Crash, Architecture in Post Bubble Japan, per mi va ser molt important per entendre realment el procés just després que jo tornés al Japó. Jo quan vaig viure al Japó era precisament l'època de la bombolla, de la gran expansió econòmica, immobiliària, etcètera, japonesa. I després va venir la fallida total d'aquest sistema basat en el fons en no res. I ell ho explica d'una manera fantàstica i explica com els arquitectes van ser capaços de renéixer de les cendres de la bombolla. Això ha passat després una altra vegada amb el tsunami arquitectura, que s'havia començat a recuperar una certa dinàmica d'inversió pública també, començaven a obrir-se a maneres de fer més occidentals, més europees, menys americanes. Això amb la crisi post-tsunami també ha tornat enrere. I ara amb el Covid encara estem en una situació al Japó molt diferent de la d'aquí, que ara és molt difícil anar-hi, hi ha moltes restriccions, és encara un país, torna a ser o vol ser un país molt tancat. I és una llàstima. Però jo crec que la lliçó és aquesta, com malgrat totes aquestes circumstàncies, l'arquitectura japonesa pot significar, per molts de nosaltres, internacionalment, pot significar un model en el que veure'ns reflectits o en el que ens inspiri. Gràcies. Thank you. I don't speak Catalan, but I'm sure that was an accurate introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. I love Barcelona. I will always come every time I'm invited but I'm especially grateful to the COASC for inviting me and especially to Amrik for making it all happen at such short notice. So we talked about a possible theme and decided that uh, a broad overview of uh, events in uh, Japan in the, uh, the post-war period would be useful. So I want to show some developments in Japanese architecture from that period right up until the present day, uh, which will show a kind of evolution uh, and uh, progressive refinement of certain themes. Uh, and ambitions, but also a kind of cyclical repetition of uh, responses to outside events. Japan at the end of World War II was devastated. The major cities were uh, firebombed, uh, and uh, two of them, of course, were attacked with nuclear weapons. Tokyo was uh, flattened. Millions were dead. Millions were homeless. Uh, Japan's urban population, which had been evacuated to rural areas in the final months of the war, uh, was being brought back to the cities. Uh, the uh, colonies had been uh, closed down and millions of Japanese were returning back to Japan. Uh, there was no food, there was no housing, there was terrible deprivations for the uh, first few years. But the nation quickly recovered, initially under the uh, Allied occupation, which was in effect an American administration run by General Douglas MacArthur. Uh, 
uh, there was a program of total reform. A new constitution was written. Oops, sorry. I'm going the wrong direction. A new constitution was written. Uh, the um, wartime leaders were purged. Uh, large corporations were dismantled. The military was dissolved. Uh, the aristocracy was disempowered. Equal rights were enforced for women. And workers were allowed to uh, form unions. Uh, the war crime trials uh, were held, but after a certain period, the Americans decided it wasn't wise to pursue them because there would be no one left to lead Japan. So many accused war criminals were let back uh, without charge back into politics and industry. <clears throat> now, this was a time of major architectural and urban projects for the post-war reconstruction uh, and for the growing population and economy. And uh, there were some serious proposals to expand uh, the available land area into Tokyo Bay, some by the government and some by independent architects. So the Japan Housing Corporation proposed filling in the, most of the bay to create new land, land for housing and uh, industry and an international airport. The second version placed the airport in an island floating in the middle of the bay. And uh, in 1959, the same year, uh, the young architect Masato Otaka also proposed his version of a uh, new land in Tokyo Bay to house the expanding population with all of the new capital that was available. But during the 1950s, the Japanese left wing had become very strong as a kind of backlash to wartime nationalism. And this was a development initially encouraged by the uh, American administration as part of the kind of democratic society they wanted to uh, engender. But in 1959, in 1960, huge public protests uh, broke out all over the country that went on for a year. Literally millions of people marched in the streets. Uh, there were nationwide strikes and clashes between the authorities and protesters. Uh, and this was all against uh, what's known as AMPO. AMPO is uh, an abbreviation for the um, correct title is the Treaty of Mutual Cooperation and Security between the US and Japan. Uh, the Japanese public, many of them, didn't want a close relationship with the uh, US. So there was kind of a convergence between uh, radical politics and radical art, uh, because one of the most um, prominent activist groups uh, in these anti-government protests uh, against the signing of the treaty was known as the Neo-Dadaism Organizers. And they exhibited their art on the street uh, and in art galleries. But much of their activities took place in a house, the house owned by their leader, Masanobu Yoshimura, uh, called the Shinjuku White House. And this was the site of all kinds of radical performance art and installation art and music and noise and general chaos. The architect of the house was Arati Isozaki. He was a close friend of uh, Masanobu Yoshimura. They went to high school together. Isozaki was still a student. If you look at any book on Isozaki, this house is not in it, but this is in fact his first ever built work. At the time Isozaki was a student, he was spending his afternoons in Kenzo Tange's lab at the University of Tokyo. Uh, working on serious urban proposals with Tange. Uh, in the afternoons, he'd go to the uh, street protests outside the government buildings in Tokyo, and at night, he'd spend his uh, uh, time drinking whiskey with the neo Dadaism organizers in the Shinjuku White House, wondering how he could make architecture as radical as the performance art of the neo Dadaists. The other big event happening in Tokyo in 1960 was the World Design Conference, a huge international event with uh, very, very important international guests. Kenzo Tange was the uh, vice president of the committee organizing it, and he wanted a group of young Japanese architects and designers to represent the future of Japan to the attendees to the conference. So together with his uh, assistant, they assembled a group of finally seven architects and designers, four architects, Kisho Kurokawa, Yonori Kitake, Fumihiko Maki, and Masato Otaka, a graphic designer called Kiyoshi Awazu, and a product designer called Kenji Ekoan, and a critic, a writer, called uh, Noboru Ken, uh, Kawazoe. So they were all interested in a new type of architecture, or in a certain sense, an old type of architecture that could grow and change. They wanted buildings and cities to be flexible systems that could expand in response to need, but also contract uh, if that would be necessary. There were some precedents for this uh, way of thinking uh, about architecture. Um, in 1958, uh, a, a radical, the largest, uh, the tallest residential building in Japan at that time was built in Tokyo Bay called the Harumi Apartments. 
Uh, it was designed by uh, Kunio Maikawa, who had worked for Le Corbusier in Paris in the 1920s. So it's his version of a unitec. And uh, you can see perhaps from the facade that there's uh, a massive concrete mega frame, uh, two bays wide, three stories high, uh, in which uh, wooden infill units can be kind of plugged in. So kind of fairly traditional apartments were plugged into this massive frame and could be changed. The project architect was Masato Otaka, who later became a member of the Metabolists. The other precedent for this way of thinking was the uh, Sky House, Kiyonori Kikutake's own house. Kikutake became a Metabolist. Uh, and this is a very simple plan. It's a square with a kind of peripheral, peripheral corridor suspended in the air, uh, a, a waffle slab supported by these four kind of wall uh, pillars. And uh, the idea is that the interior space, the square uh, plan, was completely flexible. Every uh, piece of furniture and fitting was a mobile unit, kitchen and uh, storage units and so on, that could be moved around. So over time, uh, the plan of the house changed over the decades. Uh, not only did the planning of the main living space change, if they needed more space, for example, when they had a child, they could just clip another bedroom unit onto the underside of the slab, and you would access it by a trapdoor and a ladder. And if the child, uh, as they did, grew up, went to university, got married, let's say, the uh, pod could be removed or it could be converted to a different uh, function. The same year that Kikutake finished this house, he started work on a visionary urban scheme he called uh, Marine City. In fact, it was kind of a double scheme. The, the tower-shaped uh, uh, residential buildings uh, built on platforms out in the air, uh, built in a kind of a, a modular uh, composition, a modular system. And uh, the reasons for this are psychological. Uh, Kikutake came from an aristocratic family as part of the, um, the democratization, democratization of Japan in the post-war period. His family lost their entire estate. It was broken up and given to the peasants who lived on it. Uh, so he lost his inheritance, and he never stopped being angry about it and never stopped imagining ways to make new land uh, and uh, new space. So these towers, um, cylindrical towers with cylindrical living units attached, there's a kind of a central core open space uh, for circulation and so on, and then the living units themselves are kind of spaceships or some kind of high-tech vehicle plugged onto the side of the building. So all of these uh, projects... Uh, about flexibility and change were gathered together to present at the World Design Conference. It was a huge international event. Uh, the international guests included, for example, you see here Paul Rudolph and Louis Kahn, uh, various other famous um, architects and designers were also present. In addition to the um, catalog, uh, the metabolists uh, produced their own manifesto, uh, a 90-page book. They printed 500 copies and gave it to everyone who came to the event. And it collected all of these projects about flexibility, growth, and change, uh, and uh, also added some new ones, some theoretical critical essays, uh, and um, various imaginary projects that used biological metaphors, a, a bamboo-shaped building, or a, uh, in this case, here's a, an agricultural city in which the city itself is a modular system that floats above the rice fields, and uh, the dwellings themselves are in the shape of mushrooms. So. Immediately after the um, World Design Conference, Kenzo Tange, who was not a member of the Metabolists, he was their guru and uh, leader, let's say, or, or uh, the figure who kind of put them uh, into a group, he began working on a major project that used the principles of the Metabolists to expand uh, Tokyo uh, into Tokyo Bay. So he created this enormous infrastructural bridge of interlocking uh, looping highway units uh, that spanned from downtown Tokyo across to the other side, to the Chiba side. And uh, this was based on the metaphor of a tree. So the infrastructural bridge is a, is a trunk, branches span out laterally, and then the buildings are petals or leaves attached to the branches. And this can be seen as a megastructure in that there is a kind of a fixed rigid infrastructural frame to which uh, smaller modules can be clipped on or removed as needed. It can be expanded over time. But in fact, if you look at a closer level to this uh, project, every single component of the uh, building is of the design is also a megastructure. It's megastructures within megastructures of, of uh, adaptable, mobile, uh, flexible building systems. These are some of the uh, office buildings. In fact, this drawing was done by Arati Suzaki. Uh, um, Tange involved many of his students in the design, including Kurokawa and Isuzaki. Uh, 
I should have mentioned Isozaki himself was a close friend of the metabolists, but he never joined the group because Isozaki doesn't join groups. But he was somehow on the fringes of the group and made some important contributions to their ideas. Now, Kenzo Tange explained the project using biological metaphors kind of, as a kind of a cellular growth that could expand over time. Uh, and it didn't have to be this kind of very strong uh, uh, straight uh, line gesture. The idea was that ultimately it would expand all across uh, the topography of Japan and eventually cover the entire nation. So this was developed over basically the summer of 1960. In 1961, I think literally January the 1st, 1961, he went on national television. January the 1st, everyone was at home on holiday. Uh, everyone in Japan saw him present this project. He became an instant star, a star architect, and uh, the nation's architect. Uh, and people were astonished by the project, and they didn't see it as some kind of crazy visionary uh, project as was happening in Europe from Aki Graham and Super Studio and Aki Zoom and so forth. This was taken very seriously as a possible uh, strategy for dealing with the uh, reconstruction and growth of Japanese cities after World War II. A couple of months later, it was uh, published in Shinkenshiku magazine. Not merely on the cover, the entire issue of uh, the March issue was devoted entirely to this project. So um, the 60s were um, a decade of uh, unprecedented economic growth in Japan. Um, the economy was shifting away from agriculture to industry to technology, uh, and people were moving away from the countryside to the new and expanding cities. So for the rest of the 1960s, the young metabolists, who were now also budding star architects, were developing their visionary plans with great seriousness, with, with the uh, serious ambition that these would be commissioned, built, uh, supported, endorsed by the government and by the public. So uh, Kikutake continued developing his marine city, or tower-shaped dwelling project. Uh, and uh, not only on the water, he also found a way to adapt it to uh, an urban site. He proposed putting some kind of islands floating above Bukuro district of Tokyo. Kishu Kurakawa, who, was, who had designed some mushrooms earlier, continued the biological metaphor, but uh, went right down to the level of DNA, creating helix-shaped uh, city plans. The, the, mega, the metabolist projects, in a sense, are somewhere between architecture and urbanism. They're a bit too big to be buildings, a bit too small to be cities. They're somewhere on the edge. But at the same time, they are also on the edge of architecture and product design in the sense that the capsules are sort of uh, prefabricated almost like uh, automobiles or something. So this was a, a conceptual sketch, but he later adapted it to a, a real site. Uh, and this was intended as a serious proposal for a rural town in Japan on a bay in which in the era before computers, there was some uh, interesting hand drawings that showed this kind of combination of high technology infrastructure and a very kind of um, idyllic rural lifestyle. Kurakawa was, above all, the, um, uh, the advocate of the capsule. He, he saw himself as the capsule architect. Others used capsules, other metabolists, but he was the one who really pursued the idea uh, at a very serious level, uh, making proposals for all kinds of uh, dwelling systems uh, that were developed to quite a high serious level of um, construction material and detail. Kenji Ekwan, the product designer member of the metabolists, also made some proposals for uh, capsule dwellings. And this is where I think it's clear that metabolism is not just about visionary cities, it's also about architecture as a kind of product design. Uh, but as well as uh, this design for a mobile ski lodge, you can put it on the back of the truck and take it to another mountain. Uh, he also proposed what he called the dwelling city, which used a tetrahedral uh, capsule design that was kind of a building block to create the much larger tetrahedron. Uh, with an enormous kind of public space in the center, uh, and this would be somehow implanted on the existing city. It had a relatively small footprint, so um, I guess Ekwan thought it wouldn't be too hard to find sites to place these things. Fumihiko Maki, uh, another of the metabolists, was probably the most s sober and serious uh, of them. He was in Japan briefly in 1960 for the conference, then he went back to the United States, where he'd been studying at various uh, universities. Uh, while he was at Washington University, he developed some of the ideas he produced uh, for the Metabolist Manifesto on what he called group form. So he wrote a, a kind of his thesis that was published as a book by Washington University, 
uh, about various approaches to creating a large-scale form. Uh, he looked at historical precedents. He looked at uh, projects by his uh, metabolist colleagues and proposed three prototypes uh, for creating large-scale urban form, uh, compositional form, megaform, and group form. So compositional form is the conventional way of creating urban ensembles. You just place some shapes in, in a city, and that's what most architects have always done. Uh, the megaform is what the, the metabolists were trying to do, using a kind of flexible uh, infrastructure plus module system, which he wasn't convinced by. He thought it was unreasonable to think that um, you could build a large infrastructural frame and assume that would suffice for the future and only the, the modules would have to change. He didn't think that that was reasonable. So his proposal was a group form where the smaller components give rise to eventually some kind of large scale form that wasn't predicted or, or um, uh, forced, uh, uh, fixed at the, at the, uh, at the origin. Now, um, the odd man out was Arati Suzaki, who, as I mentioned, never joined, but um, produced some pros proposals that are considered to be canonical metabolist projects. In 1960, he produced uh, his City in the Air, uh, which is basically large uh, bridge elements spanning between um, vertical supports. The vertical supports are the key to the project. He called these the joint core. And the joint core was a cylindrical tower that acted as structure, but also contained vertical circulation, plumbing, electricity, anything else necessary for the uh, running of the building. And rather than using some kind of very powerful geometry, these, these joint cores were to be located on any open site you could find in the city. So the composition might be quite irregular. You would find open pieces of land, plant a joint core, and then the bridges would span at whatever angle and length uh, arose as a consequence. He made a uh, re revised version a couple of years later, which he called Clusters in the Air. In this case, uh, the joint cores are like tree trunks, uh, and then there are branches uh, spreading out, can't leave it out, uh, with capsules for dwellings and offices and whatever else you need for a city. But it's not as simple as freestanding trees. In fact, some of the branches touched at their tips. So you could go up one joint core, across the branch, through into another branch and down one, another joint core. So rather than a kind of a, an orchard of, of freestanding trees you can climb up and down, it became much more of a, let's say, rhizomatic network of uh, uh, a much more complex urban system. Now, um, in 1962, Isuzaki was asked to contribute to uh, an art magazine doing a special issue on images of the contemporary or images of the future. And he created a collage you see here on the right where he took his city in the air drawing and he collaged it together with the ruins of a Greek temple. And in fact, if you look closely, his own building is also partly in ruins. There's pieces of it lying on the ground. And he uh, accompanied this with a poem. The poem is called Incubation Process, and I won't read it, but the message of the poem is um, all cities end up in ruins. And all of these projects he was doing were implicit, uh, tacit criticisms of the metabolists. He thought they were too megalomaniacal. He thought they believed in infinite, endless growth, which it seemed that Japan was uh, enjoying at that time. He knew that uh, things were was cyclical and destruction was inevitable. All cities end in ruin. But, of course, the title of the poem, Incubation Process, is not all nihilism and uh, chaos. Uh, the incubation process requires... Uh, the old to become the uh, to become destroyed as the fuel to build the new. So it's a cyclical process of uh, growth, uh, uh, destruction, and regrowth. Now, in 1962, later that same year, uh, the metabolists were invited to hold a major exhibition of their projects in Tokyo, and they invited Isozaki and Tange to also contribute as guest exhibitors. They weren't official metabolists. So Isuzaki came along with all of his drawings of the city in the air, including this one. And the metabolist said, well, these are great, except this last one. We don't want that. It's much too negative. We, we, that's, that's the wrong image. And Isuzaki said, well, if that one's not included, I'm not included. And he left. And they called him and said, we've changed our mind. You can come back. So he brought back his drawings. And in the middle, he hung them on the wall. And in the middle of the gallery, he placed a, a large table. This is not the original table. This is a, a reconstruction. 
Um, the original has been lost and there are no photographs of it. And on top of the table, he placed a aerial photograph of Tokyo. Beside the table, he placed a bucket of nails, a pile of hammers, and some spools of colored wire, and a note to visitors to the exhibition, please hammer and nails wherever you like and connect wires between them. And what he was trying to do was simulate his joint, an abstract version of his joint core system, but make the point that one architect shouldn't be deciding where everything is. The voices of other people, the participation of other people is necessary in the construction of a city. So he came back uh, at the end of the exhibition, a week later, it was only one week long, and the entire room was like an enormous spider's nest of wires spanning all across the table onto the floor. There were nails in the walls, on the ceiling, a huge mess. Uh, he cut down most of the wires, but left the ones on the table. Then he came in with a bucket of liquid plaster and poured it all on top. And uh, this was a kind of a work of performance art. Again, this is a recreation, uh, a reproduction of that performance in 2011 of what actually happened in 1962. And all of this was a very kind of clever, cynical, implicit uh, criticism of the megalomania of the metabolists, of the idea you could make some kind of major megastructure modular system and create entire new cities. He was saying other people are going to be involved and they'll make a mess. So um, in 1970, the metabolists were finally given a chance to prove their ideas, to show what they had. Uh, and whether it really ha had any kind of plausible application for the future of Japanese cities. Uh, the Osaka uh, held a World's Fair, known as Expo 70. This is the first time a World's Fair had been held in Asia, and it was, at that time, the most successful World's Fair in history. There were 64 million visitors, uh, and that record wasn't broken until 40 years later at uh, Expo uh, 2010 in Shanghai. So. Kenzo Tange was put in charge of the master plan, and uh, he invited all of his, not all, many of his former students and colleagues uh, and the metabolists to contribute to various parts of the uh, overall uh, master plan. Now, um, most of, uh, Japan had, of course, participated in world's fairs and in other countries, in Europe and in the United States, but usually they would present Japan as a traditional place. They would show geisha and samurai, calligraphy and tea and cherry blossoms. But the Osaka Expo was taken as an opportunity to completely change the international image of Japan. Japan was no longer about uh, the beautiful past. Japan was uh, 10 years ahead of all of us. Japan was the nation of high tech. And this was uh, an expo that was all about robotics, media technology, uh, and all kinds of high tech gadgets. So. The planning of the expo, uh, uh, Tange used the same basic concept as he had for his Tokyo plan 10 years earlier, uh, using the metaphor of the tree. So there's a kind of a central trunk, uh, branching pathways, and then the pavilions are intended as leaves or flowers uh, scattered amongst the expo grounds. The, uh, the um, younger metabolists contributed things such as the circulation elements, uh, elevated walkways, Table cars. Um, Masato Otaka designed the entry pavilion that connected the uh, monorail station to the new airport and uh, the monorail itself. Kyunro Kikutake designed the Expo Tower, where he uh, again tried to use his uh, concept of move nets with a kind of uh, open framework infrastructural tower with these, I guess they're dodecahedral, icosahedral uh, uh, modules kind of clipped onto the side giving the impression that they could be moved. They could not be moved, but uh, it was a kind of an impression of, a, uh, of an ambition. Um, interestingly, the uh, Tange was supervising the expo planning from his own office, and every week all of the uh, collaborating architects would have a, a, a full meeting where they would exchange ideas and show progress. And uh, Kikutake sent along the project architect for the um, for the tower, who was Toyo Ito. Toyo Ito, the second from the left in this photo, was a student of Tange. He went to work in Kikutake's office. He was put in charge of the Expo Tower design and uh, became very involved in the Expo planning. Next to uh, Ito, and this, this is the graduation photo, next to Ito, third from the left, that's Yoshio Tsukio, 
he was also a student of Tange. These are all students of Tange. And uh, he went to work for Tange, and, but he became very involved in the relationship between software and hardware, or the use of computers in architectural design. Remember, this is the late 60s, uh, so computers were bigger than this room. But um, they, Tange was uh, hoping to create some kind of um, uh, simulation system that could uh, calculate the movement of pedestrians and vehicles through the expo grounds and make a lot of the design decisions, like a, a very early version of uh, algorithmic parametric design software. And he, uh, he wanted to calculate, he didn't want to just use this for the expo, ultimately this would be his system for designing cities in the future. He wanted to use something he called ergorhythms, urban algorithms to generate the, um, the to, to deal with the data. And then he would create a robot that he called Urbot, ro urban robot, which would generate uh, uh, design scenarios for future cities. It never really worked out, but that was the ambition of the Expo. So um, now the Expo, of course, in 1970, this was the height of the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union. And so pretty much every nation was bringing very, very um, uh, high-tech or science fiction imagery to their pavilions. Um, the United States Pavilion, this was at the time the largest pneumatic structure in the world, uh, exhibited um, the NASA space program artifacts. In fact, apparently the most popular exhibit at the in, in, of the entire expo was a piece of moon rock brought back by Apollo 11. The Soviet Pavilion, the Soviets had not been to the moon, but they had been the first in space, so their pavilion was full of uh, material related to the Soyuz 4 satellite and uh, Lenin and peasants and so forth. Uh, the um, West German Pavilion was a collaboration with Karl-Heinz Stockhausen, the composer. It was a, an immersive soundscape, a very avant-garde uh, musical composition. The Dutch Pavilion was three interlinked auditoriums, that in aluminium, which uh, were a kind of an immersive video experience. You were uh, enclosed by video screens. All of this was very groundbreaking, groundbreaking pioneering stuff in 1970. The Swiss Pavilion seems to have influenced um, Thomas Heatherwick's project for the Shanghai Expo 40 years later. The uh, Brazilian Pavilion, an amazing topography of concrete. Korea, Britain, France also did the Matic Pavilion. Now, the, um, the, uh, as well as the national pavilions, there were a number of corporate pavilions. Corporations were allowed to build their own pavilion to uh, uh, advertise themselves, but they weren't allowed to show their products. They, could be, they couldn't be totally commercial. So the commercial, uh, the, uh, commercial pavilions tried to promote themselves by employing avant-garde architects and artists to somehow make pavilions that were so exciting, people would remember the brand name even if they didn't get to see the products. So there were a number of uh, flying saucers built for uh, various corporations, uh, some early experiments in media art, uh, in video projection and uh, so forth. One of the most interesting examples was done for Pepsi-Cola. Uh, a collaborative called EAT, Experiments in Art and Technology. It was an international collaborative, included Americans and Japanese and Europeans, uh, produced a pavilion, which I think was an early inspiration for the Deliscopidio Blur Pavilion, uh, in which the, uh, this kind of geodesic structure is covered with an array of nozzles that emit steam that turn the building into kind of a cloud, especially beautiful by night. The little kind of objects you see on the left at ground level, those were actually autonomous robots. They had wheels below them, and they could move around, and they detected they were going to bump into something that would change direction. So they would kind of move around uh, the pavilion, which itself was a kind of a, a mirrored, uh, bizarre experiential space. The metabolists were employed to design a couple of corporate pavilions. Um, Kisho Kurakawa did two. He did a pavilion for... Toshiba, uh, which used a modular, what he called tetra frame structure, oops, to support um, support this uh, central uh, auditorium space, this red globe. And he did a pavilion for a cosmetics company called Takara, uh, which looks as if it's either being assembled or disassembled, uh, which is obviously a kind of uh, framework into which uh, modules can be plugged in. This was a collaboration with Kenji Ekwan, the product designer. So Ekwan did the interiors lined with blue shagpile carpet and banks of computer monitors. Uh, 
Now, the uh, central area of the expo was what's known as the symbol zone. This is the trunk of uh, Tange's tree. And um, this, this was um, composed of three main elements. There was the festival plaza, this open space uh, at ground level, which was uh, coordinated by Arata Isuzaki, the big roof above it, which was designed by Kenzo Tange. And uh, in the background, you can see there's a enormous kind of totem sculpture uh, known as the Tower of the Sun, designed by the artist Taro Okamoto. Uh, this was all called, uh, this, this overall space, uh, known as Festival Plaza. Um, the name was supposed to evoke a combination of the Japanese idea of a festival as a, a temporary parade of floats through the streets and the, I, the European idea of the plaza as a fixed space in the center of the city. It was kind of both at once. And I think if you make a very kind of basic comparison between Asian and European architecture, European architecture is all about the wall, the masonry wall with the small windows and the roof behind the parapets, whereas Asian architecture is all about the big sheltering roof and the walls are uh, flexible, lightweight, movable partitions. So if you extrapolated that to urban space, um, a European plaza is defined by these masonry walls of the buildings around it, whereas an Asian version of that might be uh, defined by a roof above and open sides. And that's exactly what's produced here, a kind of an Asian interpretation of a, uh, a plaza. Um, the, it's sheltered by a roof, uh, which was an enormous kind of ball-jointed structure. Uh, create, uh, built, assembled at a ground level and then jacked up into the air and um, covered with uh, polyester pillows, inflated polyester pillows. Uh, Isuzaki, uh, sorry, Tange wanted this to be a very kind of amorphous object. He was disappointed how rigid and mechanical the final result was. But it wasn't just a roof. This was a city in the air. It was uh, a, a frame that could hold all kinds of plug-in uh, capsules. And, um, in fact, one of the capsules designed by uh, Yona Friedman. But there are capsules here by Kurokawa, Awazu, um, Hans Hollein, Mosh Safdi, of course, um, and Akigram. Akigram uh, collaborated with Kurokawa to build this uh, um, capsule lined with fake rock painted bright pink. But this was an interactive uh, pavilion that was a, a questionnaire. People would go in and use a kind of a buttons, press buttons to answer questions about what kind of city they wanted to live in in the future. And um, uh, Aki Graham had become very close friends with the metabolists in uh, Aki, Aki Graham 8, um, the, the eighth issue of their uh, magazine newsletter, was all about Japan uh, with a section titled Osaka Graham, all about the expo and their contribution and all of the work they saw there. This kind of thing was very important before the internet. And Isuzaki um, wanted to create what he called a cybernetic uh, environment. Uh, Tange had said he didn't want any kind of uh, monumental structure as the centerpiece of the expo. He didn't want an Eiffel Tower or a Crystal Palace and so on. This was supposed to be a neutral frame for events. So Isuzaki created a, a totally interactive, totally flexible system, an interactive system, that could respond to um, events taking place in Plaza. He worked closely with Yoshio Tsukio, the software expert in Tange's office, and uh, produced a system of uh, movable elements, seating and speakers and lighting and screens and so on, uh, with a couple of large robots that would uh, lift things up and carry them around uh, the plaza. So everything was a flexible system uh, and uh, it was about creating an atmosphere and uh, an event space rather than a fixed work of architecture. One of Isuzaki's uh, acknowledged precedents was uh, Cedric Price's Fun Palace. And the entire system was to be controlled from an underground centralized bunker. He'd been inspired by the US space program where the Apollo uh, moon landing uh, uh, missions were controlled by uh, a big, people in a big room with banks of uh, desks and computer monitors. He said, we need the same thing at the expo they buried it under the uh, festival plaza. The two robots uh, were called Deme. Deme is Japanese for bug eyes, because they have these two big globes at the top. Uh, and the other one was called Deku. Uh, Deku is short for Dekunobo. In Japanese, Dekunobo means wooden doll. But if you call someone a Dekunobo, what you're saying is they 
They're a blockhead. They have a wooden head. Because he thought this robot was stupid. It just rolled back and forth. It had a mini control center in the belly. And Isozaki was planning to ride in the belly of this one and control events like a mad scientist during the opening uh, events of the expo. Uh, but uh, Demi was a very clever robot. It could do all kinds of things. It could appear and disappear in clouds of steam. It could emit fragrances. It could lift people up and spin them around and so forth. And so the robots were uh, partly to uh, film and uh, project and film, to record uh, the sounds, but also to project sounds uh, and to move around uh, lighting things up and being part of the action. And so uh, people could not only dance around them, they could uh, dance on top of the robots too. Because throughout the entire six months of the expo, there were uh, public performances all day long, some of them very avant-garde and some of them very uh, traditional. Now, the third element of uh, the symbol zone is the Tower of the Sun, designed by Taro Okamoto. That's Okamoto on the right, uh, Tange looking uh, a little bit surprised on the left. Uh, they were close friends for a long time, but ideologically very opposed, which is why I think uh, Tange wanted Okamoto involved. Because when Okamoto saw Tange's big space frame and uh, kind of infrastructural system, he wanted to break it. He, he didn't like it. He wanted to be aggressively uh, make not only a contrast with it, but actually physically destroy it. He wanted to put his Tower of the Sun through a hole in the roof. And here he is explaining to Isozaki his plans. Isozaki also looks a little baffled. So he went to work building the uh, Tower of the Sun uh, and then oversaw its construction on site. It, um, it has four faces. You can see one on the belly there in the back, but there was also this golden face suspended at the top. There was a, uh, the, the black face on the back, and uh, not many people know there was also another fourth face in the uh, basement level. And that's because this was not a sculpture. This was not just an object. Uh, it was, in fact, the main theme pavilion of the expo. It was hollow, uh, and it was a, an ex exhibit about the history of the evolution of life on Earth. So at the basement level, under the plaza, there was uh, kinds of uh, dioramas of uh, uh, single-cell organisms and jellyfish and so forth. And there was a kind of a tree that went up through the center of the, uh, of the tower uh, with progressive evolution from fish to lizards to mice to monkeys to eventually um, uh, human beings. So you exited through one of the arms into the city in the air of the big roof and toured all of the capsules and then descended um, what looks like a very steep escalator to get back to ground level. And this was located on the expo grounds deliberately to uh, confront uh, Kikutake's expo tower. And uh, Okamoto said this was a confrontation, a showdown between primitive and modern, between the traditional and the contemporary. Now, this was 1970. The you remember I mentioned in 1960 there were massive public protests in Japan over the signing of a treaty. That particular treaty between the US and Japan had to be renewed every 10 years. 1970 was the year of its renewal, and naturally uh, there was trouble. The riots uh, and protests broke out again, and um, apparently a lot of it started in the architecture department at Tokyo University, much, like, uh, much as it did in Paris in uh, May 1968. Uh, May 68 in Paris was an inspiration for uh, these protests, uh, but it was, uh, uh, it was directed against the Expo, which was seen as nationalist propaganda. Uh, it was against uh, Japanese complicity in the Vietnam War and against various other problems that young people always think uh, exist in society. So um, the, um, there were protests in the streets. The uh, um, universities were shut down, no classes for a year. And the government was correctly worried about trouble. A protester climbed into the Tower of the Sun, made his way up into one of the eyes of the golden face, put on a helmet that says Red Army, because he was a communist who wanted to destroy the state, uh, and said we should crush the expo. Uh, people laughed at him. The police tried to bring him down. Okamoto said it was great to see protest. Uh, and eventually he got hungry and came down, and nothing happened. And he was just another of the interesting events that took place at that uh, expo. Now, um, the expo was a huge success in every way, except that it kind of proved to the Japanese public that they did not want metabolist architecture as their future. So um, the metabolists basically went their separate ways, and uh, they started doing different things. Really, only Kurokawa was still obsessed with um, 
the possibility of the capsule. He made proposals, he got funding, he worked with Japanese housing companies to develop prototypes, uh, which nobody wanted to buy. Uh, but he did build the definitive emblematic uh, uh, building of metabolism, the Nakagin capsule tower, which um, uh, everybody has seen this image, of course. Um, it's uh, a double tower, two, two infrastructural towers with lifts and stairs, uh, and then these steel framed capsules uh, clipped onto it. So there's an early drawing by Kurokawa. The capsules are totally self-contained living units. Everything is inbuilt, all of the technology and uh, so forth you need to live in the modern city, literally clipped on with these metal brackets onto the concrete towers. And so this, this began construction in 1970, or began design in 1970, and was completed by 1972. Um, the compositional effect is very clever because it appears uh, the, the, the kind of, image of, a, of something living or growing, uh, like a plant, a robot plant, is achieved in a very simple but clever way. Instead of having a, a dog leg stair, you go halfway up, there's a landing and continue. Uh, the stair is divided into three. So there's a landing one third of the way up and a landing two thirds of the way up. And capsules are affixed uh, at each landing level. So all of the capsules are offset by one third of a floor, giving a more complexity to the facade. You can't see clearly where each floor height is. And, of course, they were outfitted with black and white televisions and reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders and everything that was modern in 1970. You probably know that a few months ago, a demolition finally began. Uh, it, the demolition is ongoing. It's being done very slowly and carefully because um, the capsules are being refurbished and uh, donated to museums or sold to museums around the world as artifacts of this period of, his, of architectural history. Isozaki had a complete uh, mental and psychological breakdown at the opening of the expo. When he recovered, he said it was all a big mistake. Urban planning is impossible. Um, but nonetheless, two years later, working with Yoshio Tsukio, they developed what they called a computer-aided city. And Isozaki said, my mistake was trying to have a centralized control room. What we need is dispersed control, like bottom-up control with lots of mini, mini computers many uh, control systems that all interact to create an emergent uh, system. So this was, the, this was a real commission, not a visionary project. It was never built, but uh, it was for a site in Tokyo Bay in Makuhari. And he explained what he was doing as uh, what he called soft architecture, architecture that was about uh, event and atmosphere rather than physical solid objects. I'll just, uh, this is all in Japanese. I'll just read a translation of the first uh, paragraph of this text. This is uh, um, a very prescient text for uh, the period it was written. As opposed to the act of assembling stable, fixed materials to control natural information, it has become necessary to deal with electronic information, which spreads as an invisible web. In pursuing such a method, architecture no longer needs to be fixed. Space gains a temporal aspect, and obviously it will become necessary to develop new kinds of interactive human relationships. Architecture itself will become the media by which the environment is defined. Architecture gains multiple meanings. Its presence becomes amorphous, fluid, and produced along a temporal axis. So, um, 25 years later, Isuzaki was given a chance to re-examine uh, metabolism and his own ideas about urban planning. He was invited by um, a local government in China, in Zhuhai, to develop a part of uh, Hanshin Island into a new research and development, education, industrial uh, zone. And he went to the site and he said, we shouldn't develop this beautiful island. We should build a new island offshore. It'll be a utopia detached from all of the, the troubles of the modern world. So uh, he began the design uh, by... Um, finding some feng shui axes. He found a, a ridge line of mountains that looked like a dragon that set up the basic um, uh, configuration of the island. He looked at the frontispiece of the book a Utopia by Thomas More, the, the book in which the word was first mentioned, uh, was invented by Thomas More, which shows two bridges connecting the island of Utopia to the mainland. So he added two bridges. And he then tried to um, destroy his own authorial voice. He wanted to disappear as the author of the design by using a process of superimposition. So he took Beijing's Forbidden City and overlaid it to make the business district. He took the canals and churches of Venice and overlaid them to create more complexity in the plan. He used some very early versions of genetic algorithm software to develop randomized layouts of streets and plazas. Um, 
in various uh, iterations, various versions, uh, to create some kind of um, uh, layout of streets and morphology of buildings. He then used prototypes from Chinese traditional buildings, the circular um, uh, housing developments turned into apartment buildings, the hutong courtyard houses turned into office blocks, even the uh, floating boats, the, the houseboats uh, turned into um, housing units, and developed this um, basic model for the island. But that wasn't complex enough. He was still, there was too, too much Isozaki. So he then superimposed uh, Piranesi's Campromazio onto the plan. Uh, he used uh, the building shapes, the building profiles of uh, Piranesi to divide up his island, and he sent each uh, lot to a different famous architect friend of his around the world, but he didn't show them the rest of the plan. He said, design me something for a, a site shape like this, uh, in a, intentionally creating the, uh, uh, an architectural version of the surrealist game, The Exquisite Corpse, where things are juxtaposed without relationships. He then created an exhibition in Tokyo in which uh, his design was uh, uh, the centerpiece, but there were four or five other uh, islands models set up, which he invited other artists and architects to create their own version. And one of the, uh, one of the platforms uh, was available for visitors to the gallery to make changes to. But he also set up a website, this is 1994, it was very uh, advanced, uh, which allowed people all over the world to send suggestions, which were then incorporated into the design. So this was an updated version of what he had been doing uh, in 1962, uh, trying to allow other people to participate in the creation of an urban plan. So in a certain sense, Isuzaki was substituting the biological metaphors of his metabolist friends with uh, a kind of semiotic informational view of, of architecture and cities, not composing forms, but implementing command and control networks. So um, in a sense, all of the uh, surveillance and control and cybernetic systems pioneered at Osaka in 1970. Um, these, space, these spaces were defined by operable surfaces and devices. Um, they were experienced as atmosphere and activity. Um, these were a premonition and a paradigm for uh, Japanese cities today. How am I doing for time? I could stop there or I can keep talking. Keep talking. Yeah. We will be here for days. So I'll give you one more section. So if I just go back to the, this guy here, these two, Toyo Ito and Yoshio Tsuki, they were working together in Tange's office as junior architects developing the EXO plan, and they, they had a plan themselves. They were going to, when the EXO was finished, they were going to make a new type of architectural practice that combined information technology and building hardware. It was going to be infotech architecture, and they were going to call themselves Urbot. They stole the name from Tange. Finally, the partnership didn't happen. Uh, Tukio stayed independent. He went to collaborate with Isozaki and do some other things. But nonetheless, when Ito founded his office in 1971, he called himself Urbot for the first 10 years. And his first projects were all labeled Urbot 1, 2, 3, and so on. His first uh, house was um, the aluminium house, uh, designed for his sister, I think. Uh, no, his sister-in-law. Um, I can't remember exactly, but uh, the exterior, he said, was inspired by uh, Archigram, the interior inspired by Charles Moore and Sea Ranch. He made various other versions of, uh, of the Urbot idea in which every family member gets their own capsule, and the capsule has its own little skylight, uh, and then there's a large shared living space. And he acknowledged that these were absurd designs. These skylights were too tall to bring in any light. And then um, finally, for the, the third version uh, of, of Urbot, the capsules escaped from the house and started wandering around the city. So this was, uh, this was obviously a kind of a humorous, cynical, satirical um, response to metabolism. His view was that metabolism was crazy. You weren't going to put people in little capsules. And Ito's career really begins with um, this house here in 1976, the White U. This was designed for a sister of his who had just lost her husband to cancer. She had two young children and she was grieving. And the house was somewhere uh, that was somehow a memorial to the husband and uh, a place for her to grieve. Uh, so Ito designed it using what he called morphemes. Uh, phonemes in language are sounds that have no inherent meaning, that, that are assembled to make words with meaning. So these shapes, the curves and the step lines and so on, these are architectural morphemes. No functional purpose, but they're assembled to create a kind of a functional space. So it's a continuous looping space, very, very interiorized, very introverted. 
Uh, its only real connection to outside, to the courtyard garden, is next to the dining area, which, uh, and the garden itself was, at the time it was built, a kind of an expanse of black earth, which over time uh, became overgrown. Now, this was, uh, Ito's family had some money and they had some land. There was uh, more family land right next to this house, where Ito built his own house, which he called the Silver Hut, about 10 years later. And while White Yu was totally introverted, uh, Silver Hut was as open as possible. There you see the, the two houses next to each other. So Silver Hut was made of uh, um, mostly aluminium, perforated metal screens, uh, fabrics, and various translucent uh, acrylic uh, and uh, glass uh, panels. And Ito now wanted to create a new vernacular for Tokyo of the 1980s, where the, the economy was booming, there was so much money, so much construction, more to the point, so much demolition. Buildings were appearing and, and uh, disappearing at a tremendous rate. The whole city was unstable. And he wanted to create a, a kind of architecture that would, be, that would respond to this very, very intense urban environment. Uh, so he expressed it with a couple of... Um, uh, I think sculptural projects in the mid 80s, the Tower of the Winds. Uh, this is in fact uh, kind of an object over an air vent for an underground shopping center and subway, uh, which has sensors that detect the quality of the air uh, coming out from the vents and uh, the humidity, the temperature, the speed and so on, and the light, the light changes in response. So the invisible qualities of the city are made visible. Ito believed that the city is, um, uh, filled with invisible flows of information which we can sense and architecture should, should somehow express and represent. Uh, a slightly modified version of that uh, a couple of years later with his uh, Egg of the Winds, uh, an egg form made of perforated aluminum sheets with back-projected uh, video imagery. The still is obviously from Blade Runner, uh, the original Blade Runner, the good one. Uh, and then he expressed uh, the lifestyle of the people who lived in modern Tokyo, uh, uh, which he described as urban nomads, uh, exemplified by young unmarried women who had lots of money, lots of time, and, and lived a very glamorous, indulgent lifestyle of fashion and restaurants and so on. He created their dwelling, the PAL for the Tokyo Nomad Girl. This is just an installation, not a real house, uh, which was a kind of a fabric tent with three pieces of furniture. Uh, one for putting on makeup, one for drinking tea, and one for reading magazines. The project architect was Kazuo Sejima. That's her in the photos. And she, in fact, designed the furniture herself. So uh, Ito's idea that the, the uh, modern Japanese city was dissolving uh, from physical objects into transient imagery, what the signage, the electronics, the media was more important than the solid buildings, was expressed by his contribution to an exhibition in London uh, called Visions of Japan in which he didn't put anything in the gallery. He just lined it with sheets of acrylic. Then he projected fast-changing photos and video clips of uh, Tokyo by night. In fact, Shinjuku neighborhood by night. So, um, uh, ironically, this, uh, this, was, uh, this exhibit happened just at the moment that the Japanese economy kind of collapsed and um, uh, the recession began. And uh, so... Um, the sobriety of the 1990s, the Japanese uh, lost decade, it's known as, uh, caused Ito's interest to change from the city, the urban environment, to the human body. And he developed uh, a thesis that we all have two bodies, a physical body and a virtual body. A physical body is here in the real world. Our virtual body lives in digital space. And architecture should be the interface between these two things. So this is, uh, I think, best captured by his Sendai Media Tech. The competition he won in 1995, it was built uh, in 2000, it was finished in 2001, which is kind of a, a metaphor of the way um, fluid lines of information pass through uh, solid physical space. So these uh, waving strange forms are in fact the structure of the building. They reflect the trees on the street, uh, they form visual connections through uh, the physical building, they create a kind of forest of strange open cages. Just where you expect a building to be the most solid, opaque, and rational, it becomes structure. It becomes the most uh, poetic and uh, irregular. But then Ito saw uh, the construction site, and he realized that um, he'd made a huge mistake. All of his ideas about ethereal, virtual, cybernetic uh, architecture for androids was nonsense. He went to the site, and the weight of the steel, the heat of the welding torches, 
just shocked him so much, he had a complete kind of change of his mindset, and he went back to thinking about architecture that was solid and real and substantial. And he called this literally the new real. So from 2000 onwards, his work was much more about kind of opaque, textured, uh, realistic structure, such as the uh, Green Grin Project, a single surface uh, exhibition center in Fukuoka, uh, which it's kind of an early experiment, better expressed by his project for um, Belgium, for the Ghent Forum, where a single distorted surface creates all of the spaces within the building, uh, following the uh, line of the canal. He lost the competition, but he loved the idea so much, he uh, reused it for a competition in 2006 in uh, Taiwan. Uh, a less exciting site, so the building in this case is just a block, but the same basic concept of a single surface defining every space uh, on the interior. Um, very uh, interesting, clear sections. Quite difficult to make the model. Uh, extraordinarily difficult to make the building. You can imagine calculating the reinforcing steel and then making sure it's all in the right place. Um, uh, an extraordinary achievement. It took 10 years to build. Uh, this, is an early, this is not part of the building. This is a test sample on site to make sure the system was working. There's Ito happily uh, enjoying the uh, construction. The column to his left is temporary. That's there until the shells are fully uh, uh, hardened, in which case they become self-supporting. Uh, and Ito is convinced that the outer surfaces of this building act like filters. They allow light and uh, air to pass through. Uh, it's not a completely climate-controlled, sealed space, and he thinks it takes lessons from traditional Japanese uh, architectural uh, layered, layered outer walls. So an extraordinary achievement in terms of its spaces. This took 10 years, from 2006 to 2016. Halfway through, this happened. And uh, in 2011, uh, the fourth largest earthquake in recorded history caused a major disaster in Tohoku in northern Japan. Uh, Entire uh, towns wiped off the map, tens of thousands of people dead, surreal scenes of uh, boats in, uh, in the streets, and tragic scenes of people who'd lost everything. Ito's Mediatek was not so far away. Uh, it, was, it seemed badly damaged, but in fact, it's literally superficial. The structure, the flexible structure survived the earthquake. All of this superficial uh, damage was very easily fixed, and uh, it was function again soon. But Ito realized uh, he had to change what he was doing. Why was he making these crazy experimental uh, uh, objects for crazy rich clients when there are real people who just need shelter? So he gathered all of the avant-garde architects of Japan and he created a group called Home for All. And they started doing reconstruction projects for, um, for the uh, damaged area. And there was some talk about reviving some of the basic principles of metabolism without the image of metabolism in redeveloping this area. The first project Ito did was a house for a friend of his. He did it as a collaboration with some younger architects, uh, Kumiko Inui, So Fukimoto, and Akehisa Hirata. Uh, and the distinctive feature is, of course, these tree trunks. Uh, they were uh, trees that were part of a forest that had been wiped out by the tsunami. They were salvaged, bark stripped from them, and they were used both as the structure of the house, but also as a kind of memory of, of the events of that day. This uh, work was exhibited in the 2012 uh, uh, Venice Architecture Biennale. Ito was in charge of the Japan Pavilion, and uh, he gave it a very poignant title, Is Architecture Possible Here? They brought over some tree trunks from uh, Tohoku, exhibited the design process of that particular house. There's the team, Ito. You can see Ito, and those were his younger collaborators. Uh, and this was uh, 10 years ago, but uh, the, it's ongoing. Home for all continues to develop a uh, very, very humble, low-key architecture that provides shelter and community spaces for uh, the people who need them. I'll finish there. Should we sit there? Certainly. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Thomas, for your uh, recount of this.
Berlin, which I think you showed some images I had never seen. And this is something. <laughs> um, and you told some stories that I didn't know. Many of us probably didn't know. Thing is, uh, in this recount of this story, let's say from post-war to post-tsunami, uh, there are many figures missing, right? Many figures that are in the back of many of these stories, of many of these decisions, etc. Some of them are now being re-evaluated, uh, even internationally. So there are like different threads, there are different layers of Japanese architecture, obviously. But they would like you to insist on this idea. I mean, that is a multi-layered, multi-faceted, uh, multi-directional environment in which different modes of architects, different modes of mm, performing the profession, etc., are possible. It's not unidimensional. And I would like you to elaborate a little bit on that. Well, it's very simple. I had about an hour. And so you have to choose the thread or the story you're going to tell. So it, you're absolutely right. There are uh, many other ways of telling the story of that particular period uh, and many other aspects that uh, would require you to all enroll in my uh, courses in Kyoto University and <laughs> see the full story. So... Um, uh, uh, I, I could have chosen other ways to tell the story and focused on other people. But I wanted to tell a particular story that started with the image of Tokyo destroyed in '45 and then Tohoku destroyed in 2011 uh, and uh, kind of contrast the responses in terms of uh, the way technology has affected the responses and the way um, that uh, kind of the, the, the degree of humility has changed. The incredible ambition and uh, optimism of the metabolists has become something much more humble and subtle. And I thought that was an interesting message to uh, give at this moment, not just here in Barcelona, but I think that's a story that should be told. But certainly I could have told many other versions of the story. There are many stories. Right? But there are many stories to be told. Um, I had some other questions. Sorry. Um, yes. Uh, finishing with this, uh, let's say, this uh, tsunami helping out people 10 years later, still trying to help. This is actually a lot about the inefficiency of Japanese administration, right? There is no public help to the, there is no disaster relief plan or at least executed uh, worth speaking of, right? And this is somehow connects with some idea that I, I mentioned in the presentation that I did in Catalan. And now I'm going to tell you what I told. Um, the, the Japanese city is not built by architects. The Japanese city is a very complex process with uh, combining very extraordinarily powerful forces, economical, corpor corporative, administrative, etc., in which the architects uh, have very little say in what's going on which is not cancelling the idea that Japanese architecture, the way we understand it, is very inspiring and uh, very powerful and so on, and very creative. But it is irrelevant in social terms. Um, could you connect these both uh, um, aspects of what I'm saying? On one hand, the Toyoito initiative is uh, patching up an inefficiency from the administration and certain, uh, I would say, certain indifference of the pains of the people and the way that the Japanese city is really built. 
Well, uh, I, I don't know if that I agree that there's absolutely nothing being done at the administrative level when there's a disaster. I think that um, there are all kinds of mechanisms in place. But uh, Japanese society relies on a huge amount of bottom-up grassroots support. Uh, they know that uh, people will really um, support each other in the event of a disaster. J Japanese history is full of disasters, of tsunamis and fires and uh, typhoons and uh, earthquakes and so on. And uh, the community very quickly bonds. I don't know if uh, anyone saw the images after the uh, Tohoku earthquake. What was extraordinary was seeing no looting, uh, people very kind of um, uh, in very orderly queues to receive the handouts of food and so on provided by uh, the government or coordinated by the government. Uh, and, but there was very, very strong social support networks immediately appeared to, of, of neighbors of no one. It wasn't kind of survival of the fittest or, or back to you know lord of the flies people were very very supportive of each other so i think that um perhaps that might explain why it seems that there's not so much top-down help the army aren't coming in uh, the way you might expect in some other countries but nonetheless the the recovery was very quick and people were, were very supportive of each other in terms of what ito's doing i I don't think he ever saw it as making up for the fact that the government wasn't doing what they should. I think it was just a very personal thing from his own character and his own emotional response to what happened to just do what he could as an architect and because he's a, he's a celebrated person and he's not an arrogant person, he's a very humble, uh, charming person, it was very easy for him to get the support of all of his friends in the avant-garde architecture community and say, temporarily, please stop doing all of the crazy indulgent stuff we normally do. And let's help these people who need our help. Any question? No man? <laughs> Hello, thank you very much. I'm Xavi Llobet, uh, a, a friend of Enrique, an architect. Uh, I would like to comment you that you have put lots of uh, images and examples, mainly starting with metabolism. And one of the characters that you talked about was uh, Toyo Ito. And you finish it with a project by Toyo Ito, answering to the to the, that last disaster of the Maremoto, or that uh, earthquake, tsunami, tsunami. tsunami. <laughs> but uh, he in somehow is uh, feeling or continuing that idea of the metabolism, which is a kind of um, magnification of the technology. No? It's a kind of Siam developed, like Archigram, but uh, repeating the, the world of the machine. But I believe that there are uh, lots of young architects, maybe starting with Katsuyo Sejima and Sana and, and their disciples, that probably they are having another sensibility. You know? Maybe they think the space in other terms you know, that are not exactly the metabolist ideas. Do you think that there, which could be that change? And it's more useful nowadays to to be in contact with that uh, bottom-up ideology or way of the world? Well, young Japanese architects are extraordinarily varied. I, yes, I don't remember the names, but uh, disciples of, uh, of uh, Sana, mainly. People have worked with them, and nowadays they, they have their own practice. Well, uh, Sana themselves, of course, both, both principals, Sejima and Nishizawa, both worked for Ito when they were young. Uh, and Ito has been an inspiration for them, so in a certain sense, they're carrying on Ito's own project. Uh, Ito, as I, uh, I hope I showed, uh, kind of rejected his own early work, which was too kind of delicate and thin and floating and transparent, and he wanted to make something more substantial, and he became quite worried about his influence on the younger generation of architects. There are many architects in Japan, young architects, who try and make this very thin and substantial stuff. But I think that they, they all fall into the sana stream. And it's people, let's say, I don't want to name a lot of names without showing images, but there's a practice in Tokyo called Atelier Bow Wow, 
who um, work much more with a kind of a, a, a low-tech vernacular architecture. It's very clever in the way it responds to suburbia rather than uh, uh, downtown uh, metropolitan situations. And they have a number of followers. I, I can think of Go Hasegawa. I don't know if it's worthwhile naming names, but Go Hasegawa would be an interesting uh, descendant of, worked for Bow Wow and then started his own practice, which is kind of a clever, low-key use of vernacular forms, gable roofs, timber structures, and so on. But it's it simply, I, I hope I didn't suggest anything was unified. It, it's a huge panorama of very, very different competing views. And the book that was mentioned at the beginning, which I think is in the back of the room, it's, uh, it's a anatomy of influence. It's a profile of 12 architects. And I, there was hundreds of choices I, I had. I, I could have chosen many, many different architects. I chose 12 who were as different from each other as possible to just try and suggest the huge range of, of uh, what's happening in Japan and has been happening in Japan over the last few decades. So there is no one stream in Japan. There is no one ideology. Even during the metabolism period, there were countercurrents, Kazuo Shinohara, your former employer, and so on. So there's, there's always been huge variety. In one hour, I can only show one stream, but the, the message is this is just a small part of the big picture. And so your, your question is totally correct. And if I had more time, of course, I could have shown more examples. So that's the point that which is an extraordinary ecosystem of competing views and they are actually very competitive uh, against each other. There, is, there was at least, I don't know if there is any anymore, there was a market for magazines, maybe the last one in the world, which magazines make a difference, they are significant. They were read. I don't know if this is happening any longer. <laughs> Many have disappeared, but still the magazine culture is strong in Japan. Um, yes, uh, my name is Tony Casamor. Um, congratulations for your presentation. It was fantastic to, uh, to see the, understand the Japanese architecture. So maybe I stand. Um, I would like you to uh, to talk a little bit about Japan architecture in confrontation with nature. Uh, um, I would like you to see to hear a, a little bit of explanation about that because it's very clear uh, in your presentation. Uh, it's very astonishing how how important the technology is, uh, how important technology is in the, in this architecture. No, we have seen, for example, these fantastic images of the Tokyo exhibition in the seventy. There was no tree, no one single tree in the whole exhibition. No? Uh, technologies was so important. It is still is very important. No? Um, how did it change with the time, this relationship between architecture and nature? I think has something to do also with the previous question. Uh, did it change a little bit uh, with the time, or maybe change also in relationship with the, with the accident, with the nuclear, nuclear plant and the tsunami? Did the energy crisis also uh, brought to change a little bit the, the, the relationship or, or, or how the, the Japanese architectures confrontate the nature? Uh, what do you think about it? Well, the, the relationship with nature has always been very important in Japan, and it's complicated. Uh, the, the questions sort of suggest that there's a unif again, that there's a unified movement or attitude in Japan, and there's not. There's an extraordinary variety of attitudes, and there are architects only interested in technology and new materials, and there are architects very interested in natural materials and integration with the exterior atmosphere and uh, landscape. But uh, Japan, uh, the Japanese relationship with nature is um, very respectful and doesn't romanticize nature, because in Japan, nature is very dangerous, earthquakes and typhoons and tsunamis and so on. So in a certain way, um, uh, the Japanese culture tries to frame and contain nature. I think that's what bonsai is, trying to take the, the enormous power of nature and somehow have it in the palm of your hand, or the obsession with the changing of the seasons. In Japan, there's a total obsession. The, the, the menu changes in restaurants, the, the decoration changes in houses, the clothing, clothing, uh, clothing changes very, very precisely with the changing of the four seasons. 
and a great amount of Japanese literature and so on addresses the four seasons. And I think that that's also about kind of trying to give an order to something that's basically out of control. Nature will, nature is beautiful one day and it will destroy you the next day. So the Japanese relationship with nature has that kind of uh, double face to it of love, respect, admiration, and enjoyment, and fear and the need for protection. And uh, again, I, I, I apparently, uh, well, okay, so I showed some work today that focused on the way technology affected the architecture. Please don't think that's all that's happening in Japan. There's a, a lot of architecture that is very involved with nature, natural materials, uh, and sunshine and breezes and so on. But even someone like um, Tadao Ando, who I assume you know, designs concrete boxes, will constantly talk about nature, the importance of nature, the importance of planting trees, how sunlight passes down a, a concrete wall, and so on. So even architecture that doesn't look like, doesn't look rustic and doesn't look uh, charming and vernacular, can actually be very, very uh, aware of the natural surroundings. I should add that Thomas is also the author of one of the best books about Japanese gardens, which has got a second edition uh, three years ago, maybe. So he knows what he... It's not one of the best books, but thank you. <laughs> so more questions. They were very interesting, all the questions we had so far. Hello, my name is Uk. Uh, you, are, you just mentioned Tadawando, which is obviously a very important Japanese architect, contemporary of all those you uh, presented today. What would be the relationship between Tadawando and these other uh, architects we talk about today? Because it really seems like he's been uh, uh, interacting with them, but at the same time making his own path in, in, a, different, uh, in a different way. What, what do you think about that, that relationship between Tadawando, uh, Toyo Ito, and Arata Isosaki? Well, uh, Ando is closer to Toyo Ito's generation. They're about the same age. I think they might be exactly the same age. Um, and he's younger than Isosaki. But um, Ando, if you mean his personal and professional relationships, Ando is from Osaka. That's the first thing. And every, everyone else is from Tokyo. And people from Osaka, it's, I don't know the analogy here in Spain, but it's kind of an industrial city. It's a little bit, you know, it's not the intellectual city, it's the city of industry. And Ando never went to university. He comes from a very uh, impoverished background. Uh, he's working class, and he continues to talk like he's working class. He continues to play up his very strong Osaka dialect and accent. And people find it charming and humorous. It's, I don't know, the, again, in Spain, I don't know. It's a Cockney accent if you're British, let's say. And um, people find him very funny, charming, uh, uh, you know, inappropriate in a funny way. And so he never, he's never tried to be part of the sophisticated community of people who talk intellectually and so on. Although he does, he does write essays uh, and he does quote philosophers sometimes. But basically, he wants to be a much more kind of direct he has a much more direct personality. Nonetheless, um, he uh, was for some years a professor at Tokyo University. Tokyo University is the top university in Japan. And the only people who teach there basically have PhDs from Tokyo University. Ando never went to any university. The fact that he was appointed professor at Tokyo University shows you how highly respected he is in Japanese society. So um, I think they must have given him an honorary, honorary degree to somehow make it possible. So Ando is absolutely an outsider because of where he's from, because of his educational background, and because of his personal desire to seem like an outsider. At the same time, he's a very good diplomat and he's friends with everybody. Thanks. I th now you mentioned something that um, it can be easily overlooked when talking about Japanese architecture, and especially in our Catalan context. Japanese architects, most of them, at least all of those that want to be, you know, uh, to have a say in the dialogue that is going on, and there is a dialogue 
going on in Japan about the architecture. Most of them write, they, they publish articles, they try to express their ideas, their thoughts in words. Not, they are not just practicing architects, they are trying to go beyond the mere practice and try to condense these thoughts into, sometimes they call it philosophy, of course I have a hard time to call it a philosophy very often, but you know, at least they try to transcend the mere practicality of the profession. And I think this is something very remarkable to, uh, to talk about when we talk about Japanese architecture. This is quite extraordinary in global terms, right? Um, uh, well, uh, whether it's extraordinary in global terms, I don't know, but certainly in Japan, the architect is seen as a public intellectual who has ideas about society and about cities and about technology and so forth, is, and architects are often uh, involved in uh, television talk shows. Uh, I think for, for a while, Kishu Kurokawa had his own TV show. So architects, not all architects, I mean, we're talking about a very small percentage of the profession. Most architects just make buildings. But the ones that we talk about, that we see published, um, they see themselves as far more than designers making objects. They see themselves as um, people who have something to say about the future of society. And they write a lot. And they publish a lot. Strong, powerful publishing industry in Japan. Unlike here. Any more questions? So let's wrap it. Let's wrap it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your presence here. Thank you very much, Thomas, for your lecture. It was very inspiring, um, and it framed a lot of uh, ideas that we had probably dispersed about Japanese architecture. Now we have at least one guide how to collect or how to organize all these disparate ideas. Thank you very much. Gracias a todos.